afternoon. Uh, today, Dr. Viral and I are here uh, to provide a bit of an update on COVID-19 cases, of course, and, and with, a, with a particular focus on rapid antigen testing uh, and the rollout to Māori and rural communities. So, quick look at today's case numbers. There are 15,918 new community cases being reported across Aotearoa today. Uh, we do know that we're going to continue to see spikes in both case numbers and, sadly, the number of people passing away from COVID-19 over the coming weeks. Uh, that series of peaks and troughs is not unexpected, and one of the things that's really important to look at is the overall trend. Uh, and the good news for New Zealand at the moment is that the overall trend is heading in a downward direction. So the seven-day rolling average continues to decline. The seven-day rolling average is 14,969, uh, which compared with just a week ago, uh, last Wednesday, was 17,111. There are 817 people in hospital, 24 of them are in ICU. Um, I've been advised that a number of the people who are in hospital have now recovered from COVID-19 and are expected to transition back out into the community. Sadly, today the Ministry of Health will report a further 14 people who have passed away with COVID-19, uh, and I do want to extend sympathies to uh, everybody involved, uh, their families and those who have, who have lost loved ones. Uh, as always, further details on case numbers and uh, so on will be provided in a written update from the Ministry of Health, which should be being released right about now. Dr Verrill is now going to provide a bit of an update on the rollout of rapid antigen tests to those who live in remote and rural areas. Thanks, Minister Hipkins. Uh, the government's making sure that rapid antigen tests are easily accessible, no matter where you live in the country. More than 95% of the population can access rats within a 20-minute drive. But we know there are about 250,000 people who live in remote rural areas where the access isn't so easy. So today we're announcing a new targeted rural service of rapid antigen tests for those who live in remote communities. Now, DHBs already have initiatives underway to reach their rural communities. The service launched this week aims to improve connections between households and these initiatives. Uh, and if there's no existing initiative in your area, uh, we will courier rats directly to your home. So I'll give you some examples of the existing initiatives run by DHBs. My favourite, Whanganui DHB, has distributed rats via jet boats up the river and via stock trucks travelling around the region. West Coast DHB's COVID vaccination team, who travel to remote areas, have a stock of rats on board. And in South Canterbury, they have initiated a proactive distribution of rats to the high country stations in their region. I'll just wrap up by talking through how the new delivery service works. You can access the targeted rural service if you're placing an order directly via the assisted channel on 0800 222 478. The local provider will discuss the most appropriate access or delivery options for you once your eligibility has been confirmed. Alternatively, if you go to the website to order, when the online order for rats is placed, the system will let you know what services are na nearby and you can also then contact the assisted channel to, get, uh, to arrange the delivery option if you're in a remote area. We are in a really good position when it comes to access for testing and we have plenty of supply. It's easily accessible for most New Zealanders. So I want to thank all the DHBs, Māori providers and rats distributors for their work on this. Back to you, Minister Hipkins. Thank you. As Dr Verrill noted, the work that we've been doing to increase uh, access to rapid antigen tests in rural and isolated areas builds on the work that we've been doing with our Māori providers, where the number of providers supplying rat tests has increased from 400 now to 1,000. That's happened over the last month. Uh, we're also putting a real emphasis on ensuring that testing is widely available for our disability community uh, and that we are working with uh, other first responders prisons, youth justice facilities, age residential care facilities, and so on. And of course, last week when I was unable to speak with you in person, uh, we announced the increase in testing availability in education settings as well. Everybody should be able to now access a rapid antigen test when they need one. Happy to have take questions. We've passed the peak now, uh, and you mentioned that the case numbers are going down. So why are we only now uh, getting those rapid antigen tests out to those more isolated communities? 
Oh, look, we've been working on getting tests as widely available as possible, and of course, um, over time, as you as you get to bigger groups, you can then start to focus in on those smaller areas um, where we can continue to do better, and that's exactly what we've been focused on. But aren't we well past the peak? Shouldn't we have done this already? Um, the peak will be working its way through the rest of the community. Some of those rural and isolated areas will be among the last people to potentially uh, see a peak of COVID-19 cases. So uh, it's never too late, I think, is the main message. In terms of how many rats are actually available for people, I appreciate you saying it's a 20-minute drive, but people are actually going to be able to get like a decent supply because if you've got symptoms or you've got people in the house, you can actually burn through quite a few before you get to a point that you don't need them anymore. Yes, absolutely. And, and the further away that you are, um, I would suggest that you know it's worth letting people know that when you're picking up your tests, um, that you're a long way away. If you are a long way away from uh, you know from easy access to further tests, if you need them, uh, I know that um, the the supplies have increased in terms of you know the number of tests being supplied per positive case or per household contact. That has now been increased as well. Do you know what is that roughly? Uh, from three to five. Yeah. From three to five. Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's incredibly low. I mean. A, price of petrol, horrendous. People often make decisions about driving 20 minutes to do one thing or another. So how many are you prepared for people well, to actually take away? I mean, once you've got a positive test, of course, you, you know, it's, it's the real focus is on your household contacts um, and during the period in which someone is in isolation. The point, but the point is, I'm, I'm talking about people who are household contacts and who are wanting to be able to go to work or whatever and have to keep testing. That can go on for quite a long period. I mean, you yourself didn't test positive until day seven. Yeah, for those who are having to test in order to go to work, of course, the, there is a greater supply so they can get access to more tests so that they can test more frequently. Did the government at any point consider just doing what a few other countries have done, sending rats to every single household in New Zealand? Or was that just too well, logistically impossible? Um, one of the experiences from those other countries is that you end up wasting a heck of a lot of tests. There's a lot of tests that end up just sitting in a cupboard. And in fact, if you look at the number of tests that we've distributed versus the number of tests where results have been reported, there's a lot of tests sitting out there somewhere in the system um, that people have either not reported results on or more likely have not yet used. So, you know, the distribution of tests has been pretty widespread. How likely Wouldn't is it that... How likely is it that uh, some or all parts of the country will move to the orange traffic light setting on, on Monday when Cabinet reviews <coughs> the traffic light settings? Uh, look, we are, um, we've had some conversations with health about it. Um, it'd be fair to say at this point I, I'm, I'd, I'd, I don't have a, a firm sort of leaning in terms of whether, where, where that might land up at this point. So um, we'll be following very closely the public health advice um, that, that we get over the weekend. For people who don't have time to read all the um, detailed information about the differences between traffic light settings, what is the main difference, just to remind people, between red and orange? Ultimately, it comes down to indoor gatherings now. So under the new arrangements, obviously vaccine passes used to play a bigger role in, uh, at various levels of the um, of the framework. That's no longer the case. So the main difference now is around the size of indoor gatherings. In Has you've given an indication about what cabinet would like to see before you moved either alert levels or traffic light settings or from 3.2 to 2 and 1. What will Cabinet be looking to see before it transitions from red to orange? Well, I think the main thing that we're all looking for at the moment is where we are at in terms of the overall peak and, uh, you know, in all parts of the country. I'm aware that there are some parts of the country who are still sort of on an upward trajectory. So while the overall numbers are, case, uh, you know, trending down, um, there are still some parts of the country where they're trending up. Um, and so we'll be looking at the spread across the country about how geographical locations can move into different colours at different times to others. So given the fact that Auckland's past its peak, is it more likely that they're going to be moving into orange? Look, I don't, I don't want to get ahead of that decision. Um, we haven't received the advice yet. Uh, Cabinet Ministers haven't really, well, clearly we haven't discussed advice that we haven't received, so uh, I don't want to get ahead of that. Where, have, you where, taken, where, have, where? Mister, have you taken any papers to Cabinet or any I guess, action items to Cabinet around increasing um, vaccines for 5 to 11 year olds? They've been stuck at about 50% for first dose for about a month now. There's almost no movement there after that initial kind of spike. It seems like people just aren't vaccinating their kids. I think there's a couple of factors at play here. Um, one is that there are, there is, we expected the uptake to be slow amongst that age group. Um, and it, it got off to a hiss and a roar and then slowed down, and that's a, a, effectively what we were expecting to see. Um, for the second doses, we're expecting them to be even slower than the first doses because children who have had COVID-19 then need to wait three months before they can get their second dose. 
Um, so as a parent who's got a child in this category, um, there are a lot of parents who are going to find that they have to wait a bit longer to get that second dose for their children. And in fact, for, in some cases, there'll be children who have now had COVID-19 and therefore can't get um, even a first dose uh, until three months after. So, Are you doing anything to try to pick up that first dose rate? Or yeah, there's still a lot of work. There's still a lot of work there going on uh, in partnership with our local health providers and also working with schools. Um, so, in some of those more isolated areas, working closely with schools um, where they are the, the, the heart of the community can help to up, uh, increase uptake, not just amongst the kids but also amongst the parents as well. Oh, you had no, you had no change of strategy plan. You have step change to us. It's just more of the same. No, we knew that this was going to be a long, slow grind, if you like, to get those vaccination rates up for the for the younger children. Um, and you know, there there are some parents who are pro vaccination. Um, but are just waiting a little bit longer. And my message to them has always been, it's safe, it's, it's a good time to do that now. Um, but we are not, um, we're not leaning as heavily there as we were for the adult population. Just Finally, for the traffic light movements, will you be taking into account just case numbers and hospitalisations, or will we boost the rates, the kids' vaccination rates in various areas, play any part of cabinet? Oh, all, of, all of those factors are always in the advice that's presented to us here. Children are just going back to a couple of follow-up questions. How concerned are you? Because it's not even that the rates aren't going up, they're, they're declining those rates. And, and does that worry you in those 5 to 11-year-olds? As I said, the decline, uh, we're seeing a decline in the uptake of vaccination across the board at the moment. Um, and one of the drivers for that is that we are in a peak and um, there will be more people who can't be vaccinated at the moment because they're waiting out that period after they've had COVID-19 before they can have a booster or before their children can be vaccinated. Uh, and that's understandable. We do want to see a higher uptake. Absolutely no question about that. We want to see a higher uptake of boosters, uh, but also a higher uptake of vaccination for children. Just, uh, just following up on Henry's question, what are you specifically doing to target those young children or, or their parents, as the case may be? Are you putting more money into advertising? Are you trying to educate with schools? Can you just be specific? Yeah, so there's still quite a bit of money going into advertising campaigns. Uh, there's also quite a bit of work, and it, it, it is kind of... It's the small grassroots initiatives that are making the difference. So uh, getting parents into, a, into a, a, a school hall, for example, giving them a briefing so that they understand what they're being asked to sign their kids up for. Uh, in some cases, we, in a lot of cases, in fact, we found that that increases the likelihood that the parents themselves will be vaccinated if they haven't been already. So it, it, it's the slow part of the process. It's about the educate and inform so that people are making informed decisions. And uh, that is slower, but it, it is the way that we're going to reach those groups. Sorry, yeah. can I just stop off that? Yeah. You've, you've talked about schools and being, um, them being involved. You previously said here that there was concern about schools and their involvement because they were getting heavily targeted by uh, anti-vaccination messages and uh, you know schools were feeling quite vulnerable to that. So where have you struck the balance on that? In a lot of cases, and particularly for urban schools, it doesn't necessarily make sense to be providing vaccinations on site at school because the process is no different there to if the if they're getting if the child was getting a vaccination three doors down at a local vaccination clinic. So where school-based vaccinations can make a difference is in those more isolated communities where um, there's often not a lot else around other than a school. And so um, what we've got is our, our DHBs and our providers working with those schools to identify the best solutions for them. In some cases, it might be that they're using a nearby venue to a school, not the school itself, if there's been a, issues in that community in terms of the school being targeted. So... Um, there's conversations about that that have been ongoing for months now, happening all up and down the country. But there are still issues around that. Are schools still feeling particularly targeted by that misinformation, disinformation? Um, look, I'd have to look at that. I haven't had reports of that recently. That's not to say it's not happening, it's just I haven't had the reports of it. Booster for that age group as well, because uh, Dr Bonefield said last week that he was expecting a decision in the next week or so about whether the booster would be available. Yeah, we're not expecting decisions on boosters for children, i.e. the 5 to 11-year-olds, for some time. That's not really on the kind of current horizon. 
the decision making around boosters is really for the 12 to 18 year age group. Um, and it may be that, you know, we're waiting for the advice of our technical experts on that. It may be that we have some differentiation within that age group. I might ask Dr Verrill, who's been following the, uh, the international uh, evidence on that, to, to comment on that if she wants to. Yeah, there has been a um, new application placed for the uh, 12 to 17s for assessment. So that's based on da uh, trial data that has come through for the Pfizer vaccine. Sorry, I'm just coming back to Dr Bloomfield's comment that he was expecting to have basically a decision on that age group um, in the next week yeah. or so. So and are there's you been just new waiting? No, no, there's been new information oh, put right. forward to MedSafe. Yeah. Right, so that's basically going to hold it up for some time. Well, the new information is likely based on new trial data that gives, um, gives us a better picture in order to make the assessment. What What's the time think? frame for that? I'll have to get back to you on that. It is, uh, from memory, it is within the next few weeks um, that okay. MedSafe are expecting to consider it. Now, of course, MedSafe don't always make a decision straight off the bat when they're considering new new applications. So, the health people the COVID... have now signed a petition to increase the number of people that are allowed to be support people with women giving birth in maternity wards. What do you need to see with the current outbreak for more people to be allowed in those rooms? Yeah. I think um, that's an a important point um, that indeed the current outbreak does influence how those decisions are made because there is a risk assessment uh, made in each case of a visitor coming into hospital about what the um, uh, uh, chance of them having, having COVID is. And so in places where the COVID prevalence is coming down, there is an uh, opportunity for DHBs to re-look at their policies about that. And as we discussed yesterday, uh, they do that on a DHB by DHB basis. Is there any sort of centralised advice going out to the DHBs on that though? Because I mean, if you look at, if you look at it from a, like a mother's perspective, you can get on an aeroplane with a hundred other people. You can go to a stadium packed with thousands of people, but you can't have support people in the room with you. Yeah. First of all, it is really important that people have the support they want and need at the time that's as important as giving uh, giving birth. I think just uh, if we just went back two weeks in time, um, some of the maternity services, for example, in the northern region were really suffering with, um, with staff shortages due to staff having COVID-19. So that is part of why service continuity depends on these types of provisions in place in maternity wards. So indeed, I think there is scope, as you, as you mentioned, for us to make sure that we're giving all the guidance to DHBs about factors to take into account, so an enabling approach is taken. I'm working with, on, with officials on that now. I want to acknowledge that our hospitals are under a huge amount of pressure here as well, and so, you know, hear reports of people heading off to hospital in an ambulance, for example, without family members being able to go with them because the policy of the hospital is not to have visitors or other people uh, there at the moment. They're really trying to limit the number of people that they have in the hospital in order to, to cut down on the, the sort of pressure that we have seen. Um, and I absolutely acknowledge that's really difficult for families and for, for, you know, where you've got someone who is in hospital and you can't go and see them and you can't visit them and you're wanting to know what's going on and perhaps the hospital uh, isn't communicating freely with you because they are under that much pressure. Um, I absolutely acknowledge that that's really, really difficult for families. And so uh, please be patient with our health system, though they are absolutely doing everything they can to support people who need that, that care. Some kind of like rat tests masks on arrival, masking policy implemented so that people aren't suffering through those things? Oh, I think that the balance here is about making sure that our hospitals can continue to function and that they don't end up having to not being in a position where they can't provide people care because they lose such a significant proportion of their workforce to COVID-19. And um, I, know, I know hospitals are being sensible in the decisions that they are making. So for example, where someone's in a serious condition, they're allowing people in to see them and so on. Um, but they are being quite careful in, the, in just the number of general foot traffic, that they're, the amount of general foot traffic that they're allowing into the hospital at the moment. And just in terms of the move to Orange, is there any chance that just Auckland would go to Orange on Monday? Um, again, I don't want to get ahead of the Cabinet decisions when we haven't yet, yet received the advice on that yet. But, region, but re a regional split could be on the table? Well, we've always said that within the traffic light framework, regional separation is a possibility, but um, we haven't considered whether we would do that in the current context. Minister. With such a high number of people having had COVID, uh, what's the latest advice that you've received around long COVID support, advertising? Do people need to know what sort of exercise they should be doing after? Where is government at on long COVID? 
Yeah, I mean, long COVID is a real condition that um, uh, is one of many um, syndromes that people can get after viral illnesses. And uh, I know that many people with long COVID feel that they're not listened to, so it's very important that we and the ministry recognises that it is a condition, and you would have seen the Chief Science Advisor for the Ministry, Ian Town, make, make that very clear a couple of, of weeks ago. Uh, I think the, um, there, is a, um, uh, there is a role for greater uh, both support at the community level and advice for people about those sorts of things. At current, we don't have, currently, I don't believe we have guidelines for those sorts of things. Something that the government's looking into? Yeah, it is. Minister, can I ask a follow-up question on the paediatric vaccines? Obviously, there was a whole bunch of kids who got it when it first became available. Then a lot of those children got COVID, and now their second dose has been pushed out three months. What does that mean for the stock of paediatric vaccines that the government had for those children? I'm not concerned about that at the moment. So we've got, um, they've got about, I think, a, from memory, a nine month shelf life in terms of the paediatric doses, and we are only, they've only been received in country this year. So um, we're only three months into the year. So we've got a, a you know, a, a good shelf life um, for those vaccines. Uh, we are um, likely to see more vaccine wastage amongst our second order vaccines for COVID-19. So the AstraZeneca and the Novavax vaccines where we've seen very low uptake, but in terms of our management of our Pfizer stock of vaccine, which is the mainstay of our vaccination programme, we've been, managed, we've been able to manage that very effectively. So we have, by international standards, one of the lowest vaccine wastage rates in the world. Um, but it will be higher for those other vaccines that are not, as, not, not being as widely used. How, 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 how big of a deal is that? How much money is wasted with those other vaccines? Well, when we signed the advanced purchase agreements, and if we go back to 2020, bearing in mind at that point that these vaccines were still in development, we committed to spending money on these vaccines. Um, and even if we hadn't taken delivery of them, we were still going to end up being on the hook for you know some of the commitments that we made there. I still think that was absolutely the right strategy. What it meant is that we were guaranteed access to a suite of very, very effective vaccines um, that have given us now one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. So... Um, yes, there will be more wastage, but if I went back to 2020, I wouldn't make those decisions differently on the basis of that. Um, if anything, I'd probably be buying even more vaccines back in 2020 than we did. Minister, I, the Pharmac brought a, a wide range of COVID treatments. Not all of them are on stream yet, but, but quite a few of them are supposed to be. Are, you aware, are they being used in hospitals? Are they actually being utilised? Or are things often happening where people are dying before the hospital is really at? able to order the medicine and use it. I do understand Minister Little's going to provide some more um, sort of more updates on that shortly. But Indeed, in hospitals they are being used. So um, uh, right from the very beginning we've had access to dexamethasone, a steroid anti-inflammatory that's been um, shown to reduce mortality, mostly used for um, hospitalised, severely ill patients. Uh, we're using remdesivir, which is an intravenous uh, treatment that's an anti antiviral. Um, there we have access to um, a, an, a antibody treatment as well for use in hospital, but that one is shown not to be so useful for Omicron because it doesn't bind Omicron. Um, the antibody doesn't bind Omicron. So uh, there's, a, there's a range for uh, people with severe illness in hospital. Updated estimates on how much of the COVID... In, sorry, do you have any updated estimates on how much of the COVID in New Zealand is Delta still? Are we, are we in the impression we think Omicron's totally taken over? Uh, it's... Uh, the last time I saw news about a Delta case, it, it might have been three or four weeks ago. Um, we'd have to check if that is still up to date, but no, it does seem like very little of what we found through whole whole genome sequence. It's all Omicron now. Of the 43 COVID deaths that have been coded as you know, being, uh, coming from COVID-19, more than a quarter of those are, are Māori. Is that uh, surprising to you, and, and what does it say about the response? I'm aware that uh, vaccination rates amongst our Māori communities are, are lower than amongst others, and I think it reinforces the message that whilst you can still get COVID-19 if you have been fully vaccinated and boosted, um, it, the, the consequences are less, uh, less likely to be severe. Um, and so, again, it, it does reinforce the vaccination message um, that people will be more protected. But yes, it is an area of concern. You know, do you see this as a result of the, the failure to get Māori vaccinated, with which, you know, the Waitangi Tribunal found last year was a, a breach of the treaty? Look, I think um, people who have followed this closely will know and will see that we have been 
are constantly looking for new ways to reach into those communities where vaccination uptake has been lower. Um, we haven't stopped. We continue to do it. it. Right now, today, there are people out there trying to you know, get our vaccination rates up amongst those communities. Um, we have to acknowledge that there is still a degree of resistance in pockets of that community um, and that we may never reach some of those people. They, they're making the choice not to be vaccinated. They're willing to pay a personal... You know, they've been willing to pay a personal significant price in terms of not being able to do things, potentially having to give up their employment and so on. Uh, if they've gone to that length already, I'm not sure that there's much that more government can do to convince them to be vaccinated. I'm just at the Orange Traffic Light Centre. Can you just confirm uh, whether being seated and separated will, will still apply inside or outside at hospitality venues? Uh, at Red, it certainly does. Uh, at Orange, I haven't got my, my nice sheet in front of me. I'll have to... I'll, let me come back to you on that. Sorry, I just don't have it in front of me. All right, Joe. Um, um, then surely there's no seated separated... What's that? If there's no gathering limits inside, surely... Yeah, I think no it's... I mean, it's, it's, it's mostly guidance at Orange rather than um, requirements. Yeah. Um, Politicians seem to get a lot of feedback in the inbox on social media when announcements are made. What is, what's your experience so far of the announcements around uh, restrictions loosening? Are people mostly on board with that, or are you getting a lot of negative pushback and backlash about those decisions? I know there's certainly nervousness um, in the community about that. Um, it's finely balanced, I think, in terms of where the overall public sentiment is. I think that there are certainly people who are very nervous about where we sit in our COVID-19 response at the moment. Um, but overall, I think New Zealanders have accepted um, that we're now in a different phase of our COVID-19 response. It's finely balanced, would you say? It's quite split, people who are nervous versus not... Yeah, the people who are nervous, I think, in many cases are just um, not getting out and about as opposed to writing to us about it. Um, we're still getting a bit of correspondence about that. The overall correspondence volume has dropped away quite significantly in the last few weeks. The volume of kind of violent threats towards you personally dropped as well? Uh, as, as a bit of a confession, I have to tell you, I, I don't... Um, I, I've kind of asked not to be told about the worst of some of that, um, because I think you, you, otherwise you just live your whole life in fear. Um, and so um, I trust those who are dealing with all of that correspondence and all of those issues to alert me if there is something that I really need to know about. So I couldn't give you an answer on that. So why Protesters have you threatening to come back to Wellington in two days' time for a 14-day sit-in? Are you worried it's going to turn out like last time? Uh, look, ultimately that's a matter for the police, but it'd be difficult to know exactly what they're coming here to protest against. Were you surprised to see uh, uh, a petition delivered to Parliament to Chris Pank yesterday uh, by someone who had subscribed to these sort of quite violent anti-vax sovereignties and beliefs? Um, look, as a uh, long, longish serving parliamentarian now, um, I passionately believe in the right of every citizen, including those who have very unpopular views, to petition the Parliament. I think that that's a pretty important right in a democracy. Um, but I would note to some of those individuals petitioning uh, the Parliament that that relies on there being a Parliament, and some of their other views would suggest that a democratically elected body isn't a legitimate one. Uh, it is a legitimate one, uh, and they are absolutely exercising a legitimate right in petitioning the Parliament. Except for that petition? Um, probably not in this particular case. I'm not sure I would have been particularly well received. But... Um, but Overall, I'm not going to pass judgment on members of parliament accepting petitions because I do think it is important that members of the public, even those who have views that we might not uh, agree with, are able to petition the parliament. And ultimately, the court of public opinion uh, is, the, is, the, is the judge on the validity of those petitions. But it, we live in a free democracy, and in, in, in a free democracy, people are entitled to express unpopular views. When the mandates drop next week, will both of you be comfortable unknowingly mingling with unvaccinated people? What, one of the points that I would make about that is, you know, we've got a 95-plus percent vaccination rate amongst the eligible adult population, and people don't suddenly become unvaccinated. So we're still going to have a very high rate of vaccination, even when the mandates and when the vaccine passes have disappeared. And so the overall increase in risk is very low comparative to what it was when we introduced the mandates and introduced the vaccine passes. Have you continue to venture out to cafes and restaurants and things over this period? 
Well, I've only recently been allowed out of the house, so um, I, <laughs> I haven't yet been out and about that much, but I'm hoping to be. But, I mean, have you been completely comfortable with it? I mean, Dr Bloomfield said the other week that he was still regularly going out and that it, the system was designed to, to do that. But, you know, have you actually followed that advice and, and been out and about? Yes, I was at a family gathering at the Mongolian barbecue restaurant in Wellington uh, last week. And, and indeed, I um, believe that time... I mean, I'm sure I've been mixing with unvaccinated people un unknowingly in the past, and I'm sure that it can uh, continue and, you know, make sure I have my mask and I'm vaccinated myself so that I'm safe. Differently about it just because, it, my understanding, you haven't had COVID-19 yet and, and lots of us, or some of us haven't, uh, and perhaps have a different take on the minister who has, who has had COVID, about feeling safe or, you know, mixing and mingling with other people. I've been working with infectious diseases all my life and part of that job is knowing what the protections are and being able to... Um, conduct yourself in a way where you're taking the, uh, only the necessary risks and I think we've set up a system that enables that. Because you have worked with infectious diseases, have you noticed, I guess, the feedback that you've got, just coming back to the question that Minister Hitchens answered before about, you know, the backlash or people not happy about restrictions loosening, what have you received as a doctor in that way? Uh, to, to be honest, I, I also don't... Um, uh, don't look at any of the um, very negative or violent messages. I receive a mix of a mix of feedback, so and I guess um, whether people are happy about the changes to the the traffic light system and mandates and things dropping off, and whether you know people are fearful um, or nervous about that. Have you received? Oh, absolutely, that? and I understand that because I think I think of all the um, you know people I've looked after in my life who have immune compromise or. Um, uh, you know, are vulnerable to COVID in some way. I totally understand that they'll be nervous. If, just, just back on that um, visitors at hospitals question. If we move to Orange, that technically means our health system is no longer under threat, right? So at that point, can we start seeing some of those restrictions that are around hospitals loosened? A lot of those restrictions around hospitals are ones that the hospitals have put in place for, you know, operational reasons to keep patients, staff and, and others in the hospital safe. Um, we have to acknowledge, though, that as we come off the peak, um, that the rate of hospitalisation and um, those who require serious, you know, ICU care and so on, um, there's likely to be a bit of a lag effect before we see that to drop in the peak start to flow through into the hospital system. And therefore, is it safe to move to Orange? Well, those are all the things that we'll be weighing up, absolutely. All right, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We've passed the peak now, uh, and you mentioned that the case numbers... ...for those who live in re remote communities. Now, DHBs already have initiatives underway. Uh, and if there's no existing initiative in your area, uh, we will courier rats directly to your home. So I'll give you some examples of the existing initiatives run by DHBs. My favourite, Whanganui DHB, has distributed rats via jet boats up the river and via stock trucks travelling around the region. West Coast DHB's COVID vaccination team, who travel to remote areas, have a stock of rats on board. And in South Canterbury, they have initiated a proactive distribution of rats to the high country stations in their region. 
I'll just wrap up by talking through how the new delivery service works. You can access the targeted rural service if you're placing an order directly via the assisted channel on 0800 222 478. The local provider will discuss the most appropriate access or delivery options for you once your eligibility has been completed.